Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, listening to this presentation about uh, novel approaches for pre-implant soft tissue uh, boosting. I'm Giorgio Tabanella and I'm a periodontist uh, American board uh, certified. First of all, I would like to investigate with you why uh, we need to boost and we need to increase the quality and the thickness of our pre-implant uh, soft uh, tissues. Well, uh, I'll try to uh, go uh, directly to the uh, to the point. First of all, the pre-implant mucosa is that a soft tissue that is uh, attached to the transmucosal components of every single endosseous dental implants, no matter if the abutment is made of zirconia or highly polished uh, titanium. Uh, in particular, there are three different areas of interest. Uh, we do have the connected tissue, which is very close to the implant platform and highly vascularized. Then we do have the junction epithelium, which is more uh, coronal. And finally, we do have the sulcus, so which is exactly the area where the prosthetic margin is positioned. Uh, something which is very, very important to remember is that, first of all, the preimplant mucosa is the most important uh, tissues to prevent bacterial ingrowth and bacterial uh, migrations is the number one reason for which we might have uh, cases of perimplantitis which means also of course uh, uh, some kind of uh, failures and uh, uh, anesthetic results of every, every kind of endosseous dental implant uh, therapy. So we need to prevent bacterial growth and the best way to prevent bacterial growth in order to prevent biologic complication is to increase the quality of the pre implant mucosa. This is absolutely the most important reason for which we need to manipulate every single uh, mucosa around uh, each uh, dental implant. So we need to achieve what is called a sub-tissue sealing. In particular, uh, we did a study and we did uh, human histologies where we show that there are multiple, uh, multiple circumferential uh, layers of collagen fibers which are absolutely in contact and adherent to the titanium uh, abutment. Then of course we have a connective tissue uh, that can be increased in thickness based on the technique that we can uh, perform in mucogenital plastic surgery and then finally we have the oral epithelium. But the collagen fibers are firmly adherent to the uh, abutment of every uh, dental implant. So this is absolutely very very important to obtain the sub-tissue sealing. Another important reason for which we need to boost the preimplant mucosa is based on the sub-tissue phenotypes. In particular, we do know from the literature that whenever we are dealing with thin mucosa, uh, which means less than two millimeters in thickness, which is, of course, the majority of the time, we might see up to 1.2 millimeters of bone loss after one year from the delivery of the final restoration. And of course, if we do have bone loss, of course, we might have also a decrease in the height of the pink aesthetics around the neck of the, of the implant. But whenever we're dealing with a thick tissue, which means a mucosa uh, of uh, about uh, two millimeters of thickness or more, we have six times less chances of having pre-implant bone loss up to one uh, year. Of course, we have 1.2 millimeters of bone loss in thin uh, tissues versus 0.2 millimeters of bone loss in thick tissues. And this means, of course, prevention of any kind of complications around the neck of the implant. So that's the reason number two for which we should perform soft tissue thickening. Another important part is, seems to be played by uh, the keratinized mucosa. Uh, Wenstrom did a beautiful study where he started looking at uh, 19 different uh, publications and, of course, uh, uh, it was evaluated that there is a need of adequate mucosa and for adequate mucosa we mean at least two millimeters of widow keratinized mucosa. Of course there is not a perfect link and association between keratinized mucosa and of course per implant bone loss. They are not associated. There is no association between keratinized mucosa and uh, longevity of the implant but for sure we do have a, a higher plaque score and higher bleeding scores whenever the keratinized mucosa is less than two millimeters. So we need to perform not only soft tissue thickening but also to increase the band of keratinized mucosa to prevent of course uh, uh, inflammation of the mucosa itself. So there is evidence to support then the need also for keratinized mucosa. 
The uh, other point is uh, that in about one third of our patients, we need to perform then a connective tissue graft, which is the number one technique to obtain uh, pre implants of tissue thickening and, of course, to increase the benocaritinized mucosa. But, of course, this is a technique that is not uh, that is not easy to apply if an, a patient, for example, is receiving eight or ten implants. How many connective tissue grafts we're supposed to perform in that patient? So we need to uh, move towards different techniques. I would like to share with you three different clinical cases and how we were dealing with uh, pre-implant uh, mucosa tissues. This is a case of uh, um, about 16, 17 years ago, and how we move towards minimal invasive approaches and novel uh, techniques to boost the peripheral mucosa uh, with no uh, absolutely any kind of possibility of complication. So, this is an example of a case where the patient show, of course, uh, an, uh, a vertical root fracture of the central right maxillary incisors and, of course, uh, suppurations. Then, of course, we did extraction, we did intramenous block graft, harvested from the chin, but now we're focusing just on the pre implant mucosa. Uh, at the end, after the healing of the intramenous block graft, we need to increase the thickness because there is a buccal uh, collapse of the, of the soft tissue. So we need to increase the thickness for aesthetic reasons. And the best approach at that time was to perform a free connective tissue graft, which means a connective tissue which is left exposed to the oral cavity. But of course, we need to harvest uh, the connective tissue from the palate. And in order to um, perform this kind of technique, we need to harvest a very thick um, uh, connective tissue graft, which has to be at least 2, 2.5 millimeters in thickness. So this means, of course, that the patient might have some kind of morbidity at the donor site. But the beauty of the free connective tissue graft is that there is natural blending and of course, uh, we had to let it heal, but to be patient, we might use two different sets of provisional to uh, start sculpturing also the uh, scalloping of the central incisor, which is slightly distalized. And we were able to uh, get rid also of the scar tissue in that area with the free connective tissue graft. So this is an excellent technique because we have a natural blending and a natural uh, harmonization also of the colors of the uh, pre implant mucosa. These are the results before and after, and what is interesting is that even if we started with suppuration, and of course uh, the picture that you see on the left hand side is characterized by a swollen tissue, so uh, the patient was uh, um, showing uh, suppuration and an abscess in that area, at the end we were able also to gain some kind of soft tissue height since we maintain exactly the same level of the, uh, of the pseudopapilla even after extraction in terms of block graft and soft tissue, soft tissue thickening. Well, but now I would like to uh, um, show and discuss with you a little bit more about things change over time. That's the results of a traumatic uh, extraction of the canine, uh, then of course an implant had been placed, the implant failed, then a simultaneous implant placement and guided progenitions were attempted, they both failed. So this patient is a classic example of a patient who had many, many uh, failures. So this is a very difficult case. And of course, uh, uh, looking at this uh, mucosa and proposing to the patient to perform connective tissue graft is really difficult just because the patient uh, went through uh, multiple, multiple failures for the last uh, uh, 10 years. So we are gonna focus on per-implant um, soft tissue or mucosa but we need to consider also that this uh, case is characterized by a very important uh, atrophic reach and attachment loss. So there is, of course, an a advanced category generation needs to be performed. However, here we see the keratinized mucosa is split in two different uh, planes. Uh, there is no uh, convex convexity, which is left uh, intact on the canine uh, uh, region. Uh, we can see the palatine rugae, there are minor uh, gingival recession neighboring dentition. We do have a lateral incisor with vertical bolosa of up to 9 millimeters and mobility class 2. So it's quite a complex case. Uh, we need to visualize the final study results. We do our digital mockup, then we bring the crown a little bit more apical, and then we start looking at the junction between the mucosa, which means the pink aesthetics, and the wet aesthetics. Of course, uh, the tissue is flat, it's concave. Uh, we need to increase that. Uh, thickness, we need to bring the current tissue on the same planes, and then of course we need to investigate the chances of getting the pseudopapilla, where to give the illusion of something that does not exist in that area. Of course, this is very, very difficult, complex case. 
we open up the flap, we perform first gather bone uh, regeneration. We see that we have an unusual uh, bony defect, which is completely towards the palatal aspect, and we have a very uh, thin uh, buccal plate, very, very thin buccal plate. So we perform our gather bone regeneration implant also being placed after seven months of healing, and now we're going to boost the pre-implant mucosa by performing what we call the buccal pedicle flap, which is a very uh, simple, straightforward procedures and also minimal invasive procedures that, that allow me to obtain a natural slope of 10 degrees from buccal, which is more coronal, to uh, palatal, which is more apical. And this means that we're not going to get any kind of pseudo pocketing in this, uh, in this area. We published this technique in uh, 2019, and of course, this is the type of boosting we can get with the buccal pedicle flap without performing any kind of connected tissue grafting. So this is performed during the time of uncovery, uh, which an anesthesia is of course uh, needed, and the patient does not even realize that we are performing this kind of uh, soft tissue augmentations. That's how it works. We start with an horizontal incision, two parasolical incision, split, uh, split thickness uh, flap, then we pass the gingival junction, we create these uh, artificial wrinkles, which are very, very important, and this uh, triangular uh, dead space, which uh, uh, is the key to obtain uh, granulation tissue and then, of course, the natural thickening. But the reason why we can get, of course, uh, this flexibility is the use of the apical uh, cutbacks and the use of vertical releasing incision. It's important to uh, do a sharp dissection and really go uh, way beyond the mucogenular junction and then finally we stabilize the flap on the buccal aspect with the use of concave healing abutment and also uh, synthetic monofilament sutures. From the sagittal points of view, it's exactly the same, but then that's the key. The key is this dead space, which is shift towards the buccal aspect, and of course we need to create the wrinkles that would allow me to maintain that dead space. And that's how we went. We went from uh, these pre-op uh, uh, pictures, as you see here, at the video of the final uh, restoration. I left on purpose this embrasure quite open because I was expecting for some kind of cleaning attachment that occur after one, 1.5 years. And we see the newly formed pseudopapilla in this area. But if we are a little bit more patient, we can get a nice blending up to three years. And what I like to see with the back of flap is that the mucosa tends to increase in quality over time. So after four years, we see the uh, coronal migration of the pre-implant mucosa and the natural thickening. There is no empty space which is left on the uh, mesial and distal uh, pseudo, pseudo papilla. But what it makes the big difference that we did not perform any kind of invasive procedures, not the connected tissue grafting, which means uh, no donor site is needed. And this before and uh, after. Then, of course, uh, we start looking at, this, at these cases over a long period of time and we see that the tissue looks even better seven and eight years after. We have a very good pen of keratinous mucosa, a nice uh, uh, convex profile, a very natural looking uh, pink aesthetics. And that's the lateral view where we see that actually on the implant level, the mucosa is thicker compared to the uh, natural uh, dentition. So, uh, we were able to obtain aesthetics and also function and most likely longevity of the of the. Finally, I wanted to investigate if there was any kind of pocketing or pseudo pocketing. But the beauty of this uh, flap design is that we can get, of course, uh, adhesion of the connective tissue and junction epithelium on the highly polished titanium abutment or even zirconia abutment. It really doesn't make any type of difference. So we can rely on the amount of tissue that we got, and we see here the good uh, band of keratinized uh, uh, tissue. How are things are changing uh, over time? Well, we modify the buccal pad of the flap by using also, and this is already accepted for prior education on clinical advances in periodontics, uh, uh, by using the, uh, the fibrogate. So we actually inserted into the, that space, which is artificially created on the buccal aspect of our implant, the fibrogate, which is not left Exposed. So whenever we see a picture like this, this is spongeous collagen and this is not uh, fibrogate. But five days after already we see the boosting of the pre mucosa. We need to be patient and wait. Uh, there is a nice maturation after one month. Then, of course, we are able to start sculpturing 
the uh, soft tissue and bring the, the soft tissue even towards the, the buccal aspect and try to create the compression area in order to obtain a nice, a nice profile. They will deliver also the uh, provisional. So that's how it changed before and after with the modified buccal pedicle flap. Again, buccal pedicle flap plus the use of uh, gaslic uh, fiber guide. And that's how it is increased. Uh, the banacardes mucosa will increase the height, we increase the thickness, and increase also the amount of withdocardinized mucosa. That's rather a view where we see, of course, the band of cardinized mucosa. We see uh, the thickness, very, very easy to get more than 2, 2.5 average millimeters of increased thickness of the clinical mucosa, which prevents, of course, uh, bone loss. And then, of course, we are creating this uh, artificial slope buccal to lingual of 10 degrees, which is very very well tolerated by the soft tissue, which means that there is no pseudo pocketing. Final uh, restoration, we see the nice blending, the nice contour, we were able to attain the good scalloping, thickness, and also what I like to call as a biomimetic. And with this, I thank you very uh, much and uh, uh, see you soon.